time for your questions. You can respond to some of the comments that have been shared and, and address questions that have come in. Thank you so very much for that very powerful presentation. And uh, it was very, it was very moving and inspiring. So um, first, um, if you could just share, I know you mentioned it along the way, uh, like where they could find uh, your books as well as uh, how to reach out to you and get involved. Awesome. Yes, yes, yes. I've got so many answers. So I started Food Revolution Network with my dad 12 years ago, and we have over 700,000 members now. Our mission is healthy, ethical, sustainable food for all. We're trying to change the way the world eats. And we want to help everybody be a part of this revolution. So we've got a lot of resources that we put together. First of all, our website is foodrevolution.org. We have hundreds and hundreds of articles on our website on all the major food and health topics of our times. So check it out. You can Google foodrevolution.org and then type in whatever you're looking for. And you'll probably find articles on that topic, whether it's oxalates or thyroid or immune health or heart health or just about any other topic. All the A lot of the major foods, if you want to turn, learn about soy, you want to learn about corn, want to learn about potatoes, want to learn about sweet potatoes. We got it. We got articles on that. OK, that's resource number one. Resource number two, go to foodrevolutionsummit.org. Check out our Food Revolution Summit. Uh, you can watch episodes of the docu-series completely for free. And that's a great resource. And I wrote a book, 31 Day Food Revolution, Heal Your Body, Feel Great, and Transform Your World. It's available where books are sold and certainly online. You can get it on Amazon. It walks you through implementing all that we're talking about here. So uh, 31 chapters, each one ends with a simple action step you can take to apply what you're learning. Part one focuses on detoxifying. It's getting rid of the bad stuff that makes us sick. Part two is focusing on nourishing uh, the superfoods that are super healthy, that can make us super vibrant and well, and how to incorporate them into your life in ways that are pleasurable. Now, chapter three is gather. It focuses on how to build your community, your web of relationships to help you thrive and sustain. There's the old saying that if you want to know who you're going to be in 10 years, look who you're hanging out with today. The people around us tend to shape us, but we also tend to shape them. So Gather looks at the social side of food and how you can implement this and be a leader in your communities. And then part three is transform. And that's where we look at how you can be an agent of change on the planet. This is kind of my personal favorite part because <laughs> I'm really passionate, as you can probably tell, about changing the world. And that's what we get into in part four. So that's all in 31 Day Food Revolution. And that's a great resource. And then I will say also, we're coming out with a cookbook our first cookbook uh, in October, and it's available for pre-sale now if you want to get a super early bird purchase of it. It's called Real Superfoods, Everyday Ingredients to Elevate Your Health. And this is a book I wrote with Nicole D'Andrea Russer, Food Revolution Network's lead dietitian and recipe developer. And we really focus on, you know, the real superfoods, which aren't like super high price, fancy dancy stuff from the other side of the world. It's the foods that can do the most good for the most people. I don't know any superheroes that only save the rich and the well-connected. So this is about being super because it can help people. And so that's a great resource. Uh, Real Superfoods is, uh, it's all about, you know, the cabbage and the legumes and the allium family and how to use them for optimal health and wellness and culinary delight. I see the question from Leilani, probably about the summit. What time or day did this start? I'm wondering how much did I miss? So the Food Revolution Summit just happened. Um, and so it's actually technically over, but if you register at foodrevolutionsummit.org, you can still watch episodes one and eight, and then you can also have the option to purchase the, the whole series for life with the empowerment package. Um, and uh, yeah, there's the, there's the landing page right there. So just a quick, simple, easy way to register if you want to. And then you can also get on our email list from there and, um, and we'll let you know if we release it again in the future um, for free. Um, and, um, yeah, summit was amazing, says Mona. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you so much for sharing all, all of that, uh, all the ways to get involved and to reach out. So we'll now begin our Q&A session. We'll be asking questions of the presenter. And if the audience has questions, we will open up uh, to the audience as well. We first just want to explain to everybody how this works. We don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we will ask we ask everyone to virtually raise their hand. If you're not sure how to do this, what you want to do is click on reaction on the reactions button at the bottom to, toward the right, second from the right in the Zoom window. Then you'll click on raise hand function in the menu that pops up. 
We will then take questions in, in the order in which they are received. When it's your turn, we, I will unmute you and prompt you to state where you're from and ask your question. We ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. We will then mute you. In order to give everyone the chance to get to ask their question, we will, uh, we will not allow follow-ups. However, if you do want to ask another question or follow-up, you can raise your hand again and get on the back of the line. So with that, I see that we have one question from the audience here, and that is Dominique. Dominique, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, my name is Dominique. I'm uh, from Canada, and I was uh, really happy to see Ocean because I followed the Food Revolution Network Summit, and it was amazing. I even bought the Empowerment and Advanced Empowerment Package. Because awesome. I have so many people in my life who have been, well, who have been trying to um, get to drink the Kool-Aid, but obviously it's not working. And um, so you said love them be, uh, in re uh, regardless of their what they eat and stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm an ethical vegan. And I have seen so many um, horrific images of uh, animal torture than... Yeah that when I see either, you know, chicken, whatever, I just see these images and I cannot be part of this. Yeah. So it's hard for me because I'd like to partake and to be, you know, loving and stuff, but it's just, it, it, it gets me to my soul and I cannot partake. Yeah. Do you have, so do you have uh, any <laughs> suggestions? Yeah, I get it. I get it. You know, this is one of the hardest things, um, to face, I, I'll, I'll say like, uh, uh, this is a, not a metaphor I use widely, but I'm Jewish and, um, you know, I have ancestors who have endured a lot of suffering. And, um, you know, there was a time when Nazi Germany was using human bodies to create lampshades. And, you know, I don't think there was actually cannibalism going on, but, you know, some horrific things. And, um, you know, I think that to an ethical vegan, it can feel a little bit similar, like the notion of eating animal flesh can feel a little bit like eating human flesh. It's like, just because it's normal, just because it's, it's common in our society, doesn't make it conscionable. And, you know, what I, my perspective is that everyone draws the line of um, ethics in a different spot. So like to one, I don't know anybody who would actually eat human flesh, right? Um, and I don't know many people that would want to eat monkeys or dogs or cats because there's a sense of connectedness. There's a sense of relatedness. Um, but, um, you know, I think then somewhere over there, you've got in you know, most people, there's kind of a hierarchy, maybe like maybe there's pigs and there's cows and then there's chickens and then there's fish and, you know, and then there's, you know, um, you know, whatever, like you get to clams or whatever. And then, and then, somewhere over there, you got plants. And then some people say plants have feelings too, right? And my perspective is that there is a spectrum of human relatedness that each of us has a different sensibility around. So to one person, it's a really crisp line, like mammals, or it's, it's you know, warm-blooded creatures, or it's anybody that has a face or has a mom or a, do a, a dad, right? And then for other people, it's more complex. And, uh, and more culturally defined. In the Philippines, they eat dogs. In the US, people wouldn't mostly think of eating dogs. In some places, they eat horses. Other folks are like, heck no. Why do people love horses but not love cows in the same way? It's cultural. And so I try to have like respect for people's sovereignty to decide for themselves where they want to draw that line. And I know that for many of our ancestors, they ate what they could, you know? And survival was at stake. There weren't ethical vegans for the most part anywhere in human history. It's a privilege today that we have the option to choose what we eat. So with such a wide range of scenarios and options and to, to supplement with things like B12 and omega-3s and specific vitamins and minerals that we may need. It's a privilege and our ancestors didn't have that. So when I talked earlier about how in the world to come, the learners will inherit the earth and the learned find themselves exquisitely prepared for a world that no longer exists. 
that's part of the point here is that we're learning, we're evolving creatures. And I do believe that plant-based eating is part of the evolution of humanity. I do believe that it's critical to our survival as a species and to our wellness as humans, but it's a relatively new option to have the option to go all the way to vegan and actually do well. Relatively new. I'm not saying there weren't ethical vegans in history, but there haven't been that many and certainly not going back many, many generations. So from my perspective, then I have compassion and respect for people who are doing what makes sense to them. And I also have my own ethical sensibilities. And I don't expect everybody to draw the line in the same place that I do or have the same boundaries or bright lines or rules that I do. Um, I do believe that the same me that loves animals also loves humans. And I love animals that eat animals, by the way. I love cats and dogs, even if they're not vegan. They're doing what's in their nature. I realize humans have choice, so we may hold it differently. But from my perspective, they don't always, humans don't always feel that they have choice. They haven't always made that choice consciously. And so I just have a sense of like, this is another being. They deserve love and respect. And I know that my capacity to influence them effectively wanes if I pathologize, judge, and blame them. They're going to feel that. It's not going to bring out the best in them. So if I want to be an effective influence, I've got to find my way. And by the way, I think it's better for my own heart to love people no matter what they eat. Doesn't mean I'm going to condone it. Doesn't mean I'm going to be like, oh yeah, I'm turning a blind eye. I'm still, I'm grossed out by certain smells, right? Personally, I can't help but see the animal crying in a cage or being slaughtered when I watch somebody eating it. That's part of my experience. I don't want to dehumanize that, but I also don't want to dehumanize them, like doing what makes sense to them. So I just breathe and settle and realize there are atrocities happening on this planet every single day. So many of them, right? There's war, there's violence. Our tax dollars are funding things none of us want. And yet here we are trying to do the best we can as humans in this world. And so is everybody else. Not always perfectly. And we keep loving folks and we keep doing our part. Thank you very much for that. So our next question is coming from Mona. Mona, please state where you're from and ask your question. Uh, Savannah, Georgia. Thank you. I was wondering if your book was on Audible. Yes, it is. I read it myself. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, that was <laughs> that was a quick one. All right. That worked out well. So uh, let's see here. Next question is coming from Marley. Marley, please state your name. Or actually, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marley. I am from Hollywood, Florida. Hi, Robin. It is a pleasure to listen to you today. Hi, Ocean. Um, my question has to do with your book and many other books. I have been finding it difficult to find cookbooks, whole foods, plant-based cookbooks in Spanish. Do you think that's something in the future that may be translated like your book? Great question. I hope so. Um, authors don't really get say when over which which um, languages their books get translated into. Like 31 Day Food Revolution is in four or five or six languages, but unfortunately Spanish is not one of them to my knowledge. Um, what we really need is, uh, is a publisher in the Spanish speaking world that wants to publish it and then they can make it happen. And um, at Food Revolution Network, we translate some of our resources in Espanol, um, but, um, but not, um, not all of them because we don't have enough Spanish speaking staff to provide full support. Um, but um, absolutely, um, you know, publishers in the Spanish speaking world that have an interest in these topics um, could be found, you know, um, there are there are some organizations in Mexico, for example, that are promoting plant based eating um, and doing quite well with it, actually. So, you know, using Google and, and finding them and then maybe, you know, seeing if they have publishers for their books and so forth could be a step. If you want to take that on, feel free. OK, so I've got a question. Uh, so. Um, turning it to, to health, what, what are the most important things that you've learned about staying healthy and preventing disease? I mean, the cornerstones are lifestyle medicine. Dr. Dean Ornish says it really well. He says we need to eat better, stress less, love more and move more. So, you know, eat better means essentially eating less sugar and processed junk, eating less animal products, especially from factory farms, 
and eating more whole plant foods. You know, stressing less means that we need to, uh, you know, have more peace, mindfulness practices, things that help us to cultivate calm in our bodies and beings. This is profound. Loneliness can kill faster than cigarettes. So the next one is love more. We need we need human connection. We need camaraderie. We need a sense of belonging. This is critical to our well-being. We're very social creatures. So you need love in your life to optimize your health. And then exercise more, of course, is big. We hear it all the time. But, you know, and, and there's a couple aspects here. One is consistency, like getting at least 20 minutes of brisk walking in every day is super helpful if you can, if your body allows for that. Um, and the other is intensity. Um, so you, you need sometimes when you're like, heart is beating hard. You want to get up to like 150 beats per minute in most cases, if your body can handle this and, you know, so running or some form of brisk exercise, at least a couple times a week. And then the third thing to consider is, you know, um, you need cardio, but, but you also need resistance training and strength training to optimize your skeletal strength and health. And so weights can be really helpful as well. So there's all different tools and resources for exercise, you know, but I feel like if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's true of muscles. That's true of agility. That's true of, um, you know, flexibility. So leaning into whatever you've got, even if it's really hard, even if walking, you know, for five minutes is a big deal. Well, try four and then try five. You know, I used to be a marathon runner. And then a few years back, I had completely stopped running. I wanted to start up again. And I started with like running three minutes, jogging. And I remembered what it was like to run fast for hours. And now I was like jogging for three minutes, but I knew I had to start slow. And even then I was like sore the next day and I felt ashamed, but I kept at it. And the next day I did four minutes and the next day I did five minutes, slowly, slowly, slowly. And within a few months, I was jogging five miles and getting it back. It comes back, but it takes time. So like have patience with yourself, have love for yourself if you're not in the best of shape at some point, but then keep going and and make it a habit but the other thing it, about exercise and i'm emphasizing exercise a lot because i think it's so important to health and wellness and we've been talking mostly about food the other thing about exercise is you want to do things that you enjoy that that you love actually and ideally bonus points if there's social connection involved for someone else to do it with because that'll make you more accountable and you'll also get any more of your love need met in that process and exercise is good for stress reduction and by the way if you exercise more you're more likely to eat better because you're actually going to cultivate more actual body aliveness and connection. Um, I think mindful eating is also helpful, by the way, like actually noticing your food, having a relationship to it. Um, there are studies showing that when people grow vegetables, they eat vegetables more. There's also studies showing that when people prepare food, they enjoy it more because they're more connected to it. So also taking the time to savor, to smell, to absorb, to be in that relationship and to listen to your own body and not overeat. Michael Pollan famously said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I think this is a great wisdom to live by. And the not too much part means you don't overstuff yourself. The average American eats at least 500 calories too much every day. And that translates to wasted money, uh, wasted resources, and also excess weight that we tend to carry around in our bodies. If you eat too many calories, you're probably gonna weigh more than you want to. So optimal food depends on knowing when you're full and listening to your body satiety symbols. That's easier when you're eating real food. When you're eating hyper-processed foods, it's easier to override your body's natural impulses. All right, great answer. So our next question is coming from Marsha. Marsha, please uh, state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, my name is Marsha and I'm from New York. Um, I was just wondering if you could Tell me which book it was that your granddad read that changed uh, his life. Because I looked online yeah. and your dad wrote many books. Diet for a New America is the classic from 1987 that became a runaway bestseller and kind of launched my dad's career, if you will, um, as a food revolutionary activist and leader. Thank you so much. Sure. I'm going to read that book. Yeah, it's it's a classic. It's it's brilliant. Even though it's been 36 years, it's still it's still got a timeless quality to it. All right. Next question. So aside from animal products, what other foods cause damage to, to the climate and the planet and to our natural resources? 
You know, um, there are more and less resource intensive foods for the most part. They all pale in comparison because in all cases, humans would be eating them directly instead of cycling them through livestock, which is like a protein factory in reverse. So there are, you know, nuances there. I focus more on the health impacts um, than because for the most part, all plant foods are such a big step in the right direction. That said, I mean, like from a water perspective, almonds are pretty consumptive. Um, so, you know, from a, for example, from a, um, I mean, and legumes are awesome, by the way, from an environmental perspective. So for example, from that standpoint, soy milk is going to be a better option than almond milk from a resource perspective. Um, also better than say oat milk or most of the milks, because most of the plant milks have added sugars in them and soy milk often doesn't, um, so it makes also much higher in protein than anything other than pea milk um, because, and pea milk's made with, you know, pea protein typically. Um, so, you know, but there's all different pros and cons, but personally, I'm a big fan of unsweetened Eden soy or homemade soy milks for my favorite plant milk options. Um, and, uh, but yeah, resource wise, uh, less processed is going to be better. More organic is going to be better. More local is going to be better. So, you know, if you can support local farmers, community supported agriculture is one of my favorite things to support because you have a direct relationship with farms and there's over 10,000 CSA programs in the US alone. There's, there's programs like this around the world. Basically you get a share of the food grown by a farm and then the, you know, the farmers have a degree of security because there's recurring income for them and you get a stake in, in their produce and what they produce literally. And, um, and you always get what's in season. It's grown locally. So if you live in a community where that's available to you, um, that's awesome. Uh, farmers markets, again, are wonderful. Supporting, if you can't do any of that, supporting um, you know, natural food stores over supermarkets, if you can, if they're available to you. Um, if you just have supermarkets or Walmart or Costco or something in your area, then again, look for organic support local foods if they they put them they'll often say if some things are from local areas and they're often trying even in big supermarkets to have some local relationships so those are all steps you can take that are meaningful and can help getting away from packaged foods can help you know you, you want to avoid um things that are in plastic we're practically drowning in plastic today um and um you know so those those are all big steps um we don't even and we try to avoid plastic even in our kitchen. So we store our food in glass containers with plastic snap on lids, but the food's not touching plastic. And those glass containers are of course go through the dishwasher. They're completely reusable. And um, I don't want that plastic leaching into my body or my kids' bodies. So we, we don't use the nonstick pans with like Teflon coating, cause that can degrade. We use enamel coated cast iron um, for, for, for pans and then stainless steel for pots. Um, just thinking about all the ways you can reduce your toxic load and your environmental burden, as well as your environmental footprint. These are all steps you can take. Great. Thank you for that answer. So what do you say to people who say that we don't, or that, um, excuse me, um, that we need animal products to feed the world? Well, uh, I say that it's kind of the opposite. I mean, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, 82% of the world's land is being used to produce 18% of the world's calories with animal agriculture. So we can feed the world so much more efficiently when we use that biomass, all that ecosystem base, all that water and soil and space to grow food for humans directly. Instead of that reverse protein factory, it comes with cycling calories into livestock. So that's the bottom line there. Um, now, to be a little bit more nuanced about it, there are some places where small amounts of animal agriculture could be sustainable. Absolutely. Backyard chickens in some places, they're pecking around in the soil and chewing it up and eating bugs and pooping. That can have a place. Uh, ethically, people may have problems with that for a variety of reasons. What happens to the baby male chicks? Are they just killed? What happens to chickens when they stop laying eggs? Um, are they gonna be killed? Some people I know literally have backyard chickens and they have old older chickens that don't lay any eggs anymore and they still take care of them, you know? 
mm-hmm. and they feed them compost from their and the chickens are pooping. And I don't have a big ethical problem with that personally. Some people may, and I respect all perspectives, not telling anybody what they should or shouldn't eat. But from an ethical standpoint and from an environmental standpoint, I think there's a place. Um, and from a ethical and environmental standpoint, there may be other other animal agricultural options that that could make sense in some situations. I'm not big on uh, fundamentalism personally. I'm interested in whatever works, whatever can help us survive as a species and make a better world for our kids and be healthy as humans is what I'm interested in. Um, but um, you know, for example, bees. I think that honey done well uh, can can actually be respectful for the bees and actually be a part of a balanced ecosystem where we're pollinating crops and giving the bees a home. Um, unfortunately, industrialized honey honey is often quite cruel to the bees and steals all their honey and then feeds them high fructose corn syrup, um, which I think is just cr- incredibly cruel. Um, so you know, we we have to draw our own ethical lines, but. I do believe that there can be a place for consciously used animal agriculture in some places. There are ecosystems in the Himalayas where they can have yaks and there's like a huge amount of land and a little bit of grass and there's not much else growing and they have the yak butter and milk. And I like, I'm not going to argue about that. If the Tibetan people want to have yaks out there, like that's not, that's not my issue, right? My mm-hmm. issue is with industrialized farming on a massive scale for those of us who live in a society where we have choice and we have lots of options available right at our fingertips and some have very different impact than others. Okay, thank you. That's a great response. So uh, our next question is coming from Dominique. Dominique, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, I, it's a second question for me. So I'm from Canada. I just uh, hearing you talking about um, the animal agriculture that could be possible. What do you think, Ocean, about eating um, insects? <laughs> well, um, ethic, it sounds gross, personally. It's just me, right? Maybe other people feel that way too. But I'll put that aside for a second. Let's imagine... And I, and I and I I don't love the idea of of killing insects, right? Like they are still a living creature that would probably fly away if it could and doesn't want to die. So I suspect ethically that it's not going to fit with my personal sensibilities. From a uh, but but do I like I talked earlier about that spectrum? Like I would rather eat an insect than eat a pig or a cow or a dog or a cat, you know, right? Personally, so my sensibility is. It's somewhere over there, but I think I, it's on the on the on the closer side of the line for me personally. But I respect humans doing what makes sense to them. From a um, from an environmental standpoint, insects, uh, what are they fed? And do they produce waste? Um, and that's the big question: Is it sustainable, or is it the same protein factory universe? Are we going to feed them feedstuffs that are growing on land that inefficiently is cycled through them? Or are they actually consuming waste? Uh, it matters a lot what they're eating and where they're living and what waste products come out of it. And animal agriculture doesn't have a very good reputation in this regard. Fish farms are an environmental disaster and an, envir- and an ethical disaster, at least in most cases today. Um, we're literally giving fish antibiotics to keep them alive under deplorable conditions. We're feeding them fish from the wild oceans and getting a terrible feed conversion ratio, like three or four or five to one. So again, we're wasting all these calories. So we think the fish farms are like helping preserve the wild oceans, but they're actually the opposite. And they're producing a massive amounts of pollution. And the fish are living in horrible conditions surrounded by a sea of fecal material super unnatural because they're so concentrated. So there tend to be downsides to all of this, but show me an option where it actually works, where it's sustainable, where it's taking waste and making something that humans could eat. And I'm like, you know what, from an environmental standpoint, if it actually works, I'm open-minded to learning more. And then there's the ethical considerations, which I may still not partake, but you know what, like I'm, we're, we're in a serious situation in the world today. I was always against nuclear power, I'm not anymore. You know, it's not my favorite form of electricity. But at this point, I feel like with what we're facing in the world, we're going to have to make some trade-offs. So if it could be part of the solution, I'm curious. I feel the same about lab meat. Like, I'm not a fan. I'm probably not ever going to eat it. 
But if it can help save our world and give us a world that our children can inherit, then you know what? Like I'm open-minded, right? There's some trade-offs. I'm not a fundamentalist. I want whatever works. That's kind of my take on it. Great. Thank you, Ocean. So uh, based on uh, on what you've learned and, and the, the current information out there, uh, how many more years will the planet, if, if things go on the way that they are and we don't make a, a major shift, how many more years will the planet be able to provide food b- uh, before climate change makes it challenging for uh, for us to provide food for the world's population? It's already challenging for a lot of people. We're already running out of water in many parts of the world. We're already facing droughts and floods and uh, water, salt water intrusion. Um, and it's it's going to get, it's it's not like there's a tipping point moment. It's like it gets worse and worse. And it, maybe that accelerates with the, the path that we're on. Um, so, you know, I think that we could be looking at a world within the next generation where we have, you know, a billion people starving to death or more. Um, We're hearing about by 2060, 1.4 billion environmental refugees um, being projected by the United Nations. Um, There's 1.4 billion refugees. Where are they going to go? Are they going to compete with other populations for scarce resources? Is that going to lead to war? I mean, we could have some really dark prospects as a species. Florida could be underwater within a generation. New York City could be underwater. These are not just science fiction stories. These are scientific probabilities uh, that some of us may unfortunately live to see. But at the same time, I think it's really important to remember that let's suppose that we can grow enough food to feed 1.4 billion less humans in a generation. Well, if we eat lower on the food chain, we can more than make up for that. We could probably feed a population of 12, 15 billion with current resources just by eating plant-based. And so if we lose some of that, but we make the shift, then we'll still have more than enough for quite some time. Great. Thank you so much for that, Ocean. So thank you very much for the presentation and and the, uh, the Q&A. So um, just so that everyone else can also share in their uh, their appreciation for your uh, presentation and time, we're going to unmute the uh, the audience and you'll hear a whole cacophony of of thanks. Pour OK, in. let me just say that was a really dark note. So before they do that, I've just got to say, like, oh. thank you for caring. We we learn because we care. And if you're feeling any sadness in your heart right now or heaviness, that's because you care. Thank you for being a human being who cares. I think love can change the game. I think that when our hearts are open, we're cap- capable of so much ingenuity, creativity, healing, and transformation. So thank you for the resilience. Thank you for the curiosity. Thank you for caring about the world around us. I'm so grateful. You all give me hope. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. I 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 love you. Thank you from the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.